Hello, everyone, and welcome to another entertaining and educational roundtable hosted by the International Carnivorous Plant Society. My name is Kenny Coogan, and I'm the Community Relations and Education Director for the ICPS. And today's roundtable is going to be about winter growing sundews, Drosera, or Drosera, depending on where you are from. So I'm excited to have a international panel once again, but before I let them introduce themselves, I hope you're noticing my super cool Saracenia purpurea shirt. And if you want to support the ICPS's in, uh, education or conservation initiatives, you can buy this t-shirt or a mug or a tote with lots of different carnivorous plants on it. And one aspect of the education initiatives, in addition to the roundtables, in addition to our monthly webinars, is our Carnivores in the Classroom grant. Every August from August 1st through August 31st, we have grants for teachers in K through 12 public and private schools. And uh, the past two years or three years, we've been able to fund over about 20 uh, grants. And the idea is that we want to encourage teachers to add carnivorous plants to their classroom so they can inspire the next generation. And I need you to tell all of your teacher friends because we want to be funding teachers globally. And for the past couple of years, it's been mostly North America and Australia, but we want everyone to participate. So keep that uh, grant window in mind. So with that, we're going to have the panelists introduce themselves, and then I'm going to ask a couple of questions. And we have one question from social media, which I'll be also asking them. So uh, Henje, can you please tell the listeners about yourself? Good evening, everyone. My name is Hendre. I'm based in Stellenbosch near Cape Town in South Africa. So I'm, I think, probably the southernmost member on this panel. I've spent the past two years traveling a lot, researching carnivorous plants in the Cape of South Africa in the Feinbos biome. Quite extensively traveled all over the place with people like Alex Didrick and made quite a few exciting discoveries. So I'm Nigel Hewitt Cooper. I'm based near Glastonbury in southwest England. I've been growing carnivorous plants for longer than I care to recall, over 40 years now. Um, over the years, I've grown most of the species that have been in cultivation. Um, now I've toned down my collection and concentrate mainly on Drosera and Heliamphora, but I also run a nursery, which I've run for the last 25 odd years, and I make my living now growing and selling these wonderful plants. And like Hendre, even after all these years, you're always learning. Hi, I am uh, John Chrisman. I am... Uh... Kind of a moderately experienced grower. I've been doing this for about 10 years and I live on the uh, west coast of the United States in Oregon. And it's it's a reasonable climate to grow a lot of plants, although it's certainly not ideal. And can certainly be challenging growing these winter growing sundews since I can't exactly leave them outdoors like some people can. But I'm hoping I can provide a uh, good perspective of a obvious grower. All right, very good. So, John, can you start with why we're doing a roundtable on winter growing sundews? Can you explain <laughs> what that means? All right. Um, so, winter growing sundews, we've got, of course, the tuberous sundews that ever more people are familiar of that grow mostly in southwest Australia. And then there's also winter growing sundews that you find in South Africa. And the, the thing that these two places have in common is that they have a wet winter and a very dry summer. So these plants have developed a survival strategy to go dormant during summer when it's really dry and they, they just don't have the water to grow. And so they'll die back and there will be absolutely nothing above the ground. So the tuberous sundews have these little little tubers are almost like little potatoes that they die back to during summer and the South African ones just die back to these big fleshy roots and I uh <laughs> yeah that's... I think I think beginners of carnivorous plants maybe who are growing mm -hmm. like a Venus flytrap and then they experience that go dormant they might accidentally throw it away so we want to encourage yeah. people who are growing winter sundews <laughs> 
that's going to be the opposite. In the summertime, um, they're not going to form a little hibernaculum, correct? You're just going to have basically yeah, an that, not an empty pot. Die back, it'll just be brown, look completely dead, but you know, they'll sit there for six months, maybe even more, and then start growing again. As long as you get the care down, which can be a little tricky. Very good. And that's what we're going to be talking about for most of the round table. So Nigel, for I know it's going to be hard to to summarize all of them because there's so many different species, but uh, because we're putting the emphasis on winter growing, what kind of temperatures do they like when they're actively growing? And then how do you get them to kind of go into their summer dormancy? Mine, I, I grow them in the same greenhouse, but the tuberous species is one there, it's just a planchonii. Um, the tuberous species I grow in one section of the greenhouse, I keep that to about three, four degrees, so it goes down fairly low. The South African winter growing species, like, I'm well prepared for one. See? This is, you know, the irony is they've been flowering rather well lately, but I've only got a single cystiflora in flower today, which is a white flower from. Cape Town. Um, the South African winter growers, I keep a little bit warmer because they're in my other South African plants, so down to about seven, eight Celsius. You find they will, like with a lot of plants, let them go through their own cycles. Don't try and force them, don't try to bring them on early. You, you tune into plants, you, you, you soon learn how their cycles work. And these guys, depends on the species, it varies, but some of the tubers will start poking mm -hmm. through end of August, so fairly fairly early on, uh, late sort of summer. Some of the tuberous species for me, like uh, Strictocorlis, Fimbriata, are only just poking through now, so several months later. So they've got quite a long period over which they they start growing. And also conversely, when they die back as well, they'll go through their process, they'll produce the leaf, they'll flower. Um, then again, depending on the species, March through to about May, they'll die back, the plants will blacken off, um, at that point, then obviously you're in summer mode for them, then you keep them drier. So you have a unheated greenhouse? Uh, I heat mine. Where I am in southwest England, we get very, fairly cold winters. You know, we've been down to about minus nine, I think, this year. So not compared to some of you guys. Um, but we do get very grey, damp, dismal days, very little in the way of winter sun. So some of them do appreciate some some artificial lighting um so i have to heat but people in 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 warmer climates can can grow them in unheated greenhouses i've seen them grow in in france uh, outside and it was a chap who who uh, puts some of the most marvelous photos on facebook of his collection and you've got these wonderful drosera squamosa covered in frost and which they see in the wild anyway um we, we assume because they're australian the tuberous species this is that they are all sort of hot growers but they're not the winters can be fairly cold i must add for the south african plants they very rarely face frost um in nature i have loss in 2021 experience on table mountain it was there's a little bit of snow a little bit of frost but in other areas there's one or two species that are snow adapted a cowlis drosera cowlis is the main one it grows generally on the highest peaks in the cape mountains like matrosberg I think it's 2,700 meters, and they only grow after the winter snow, and they have a very short growing period, I think, from sort of August to November, and then they go dormant again um, after the snow, and some of the stuff I know of out further towards the desert region also sometimes gets piled in snow, up to a foot of snow, and then after that it pops out and grows. Um, but most of the winter grows, I rarely experience anything close to freezing. It's usually down to sort of four or five degrees at night, maybe colder in the mountains. I think similarly, uh, in, uh, with the, the tuberous species in Australia, you've got Nepe um, uh, Drosera monticola, which is found up on uh, Bluff Knoll. Um, uh, and um, I climbed that a few years ago. It was uh, early September. Uh, it was savagely cold um, and it had been snowing. Mm -hmm. with little flurries of snow left on the ground. So even at that time, sort of um, late winter as you're approaching spring, was still snow to be had up there uh, and these little tiny tiny little drosera are just clinging onto life up there really reduced in size obviously because the 
because of the climate, I guess. Same with Drosera corlis. And it's interesting you say that, Andrew, because I've only grown a corlis for a couple of seasons, and it seems to follow a very similar pattern to the other South African winter growers. But um, it seems to have a fairly long season as well. It came through November time, I guess, not not too far behind the other species. So in cultivation, that 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 um, that season, obviously because of conditions being a bit more conducive, it seems to have extended. Yeah, they definitely respond well to weird conditions. I have a trinovia that is going now, sort of four months past where they're supposed to be dormant. It's only now really starting to die back. It survived the hottest part of summer, almost the entirety of summer, because it had water. And I sometimes find them still around in January in the wild, where they mostly go dormant by October and November. So it seems to be fairly conditionally driven, um, but other species, regardless of it's wet or not, they'll still go dormant on a fairly tight seasonal cycle. I think it very much depends on where they grow. It's like Trinovia will often grow in seepages on the mountains, and there they tend to persist longer than, say, the sister flora growing lowland that's bone dry for the majority of summer. John, can yep. you talk about your temperatures, and are you growing strictly indoors, <laughs> or do you ever put them outside? Um. I've tried that briefly before, but I mostly grow in an unheated garage because my climate's very similar to Nigel's, actually. <laughs> so it's far too cold. We got down to negative nine back in December. Uh, and, you know, none of these plants would survive that. But um, I have an unheated garage that's insulated, at least, that I grow in. I've grown out here for years, but it stayed a bit too cold. So during winter, I'm actually sitting out there right now. I still have a coat on. It's cold <laughs> out here. It's about 53 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's 10, 11 Celsius, something like that. Um, anyway, so I, I just grew out here on a table for years, but I was noticing that a lot of times during the middle of winter, it wouldn't get above, you know, 12 Celsius for weeks and weeks. And that's, it really noticeably slows the plants down because they do want the days to be warmer than that. And so this year I, I set up this shelving here and I got this insulation wrap around it that helps keep the temperature up a little or bring the temperature up a little higher during day which helps a lot it also helps with flowering it's one of the difficulties i've had is uh flowers failing to open all the way it seems to be related to the temperature and uh <clears throat> but it works pretty well i mean these these plants can handle really cold temperatures they just they'll slow down if it gets too cold and you know, what you really don't want is them to be too warm because they can if you trigger dormancy by getting them too warm, they can go down just like that. A matter of days, they'll turn brown. Uh, it happens a lot to my friends in California who grow these. They get their first heat wave in spring. Half their plants will just die back in the matter of a week. And and you got to wait till fall to get them growing again. Do you have, a, just... do you have a temperature range that causes them to go into dormancy for the south african or the tuberous sundews uh, well it depends a lot on the particular species you're looking at some of them i've had them grow well into june when we're we've, we're above 90 degrees for a week and they just keep growing like nothing's happening and then other ones i think the rosetta tuberous species tend to be some of the more sensitive ones and you get much above 80 and they'll go dormant on you and uh, of course, I'm mixing up all my units here. <laughs> 80 is about uh, 28 Celsius, 90 is about 35. So, uh, Nigel and Hendry, can you talk about have you noticed flowers not opening up and how do you fix that? Uh, I have in cultivation yeah. here, uh, mine are under glass. And when we get those long runs of, of dismal gray days they, they just fail to open they seem to look as if they're attempting to open for a few days and they just seem to abort when we get days like this we actually get some decent sun then you get some decent temperatures 
accordingly in the greenhouse. So the temperature can go up to sort of about 75 during the uh, during the daytime and then cold at night, which is absolutely fine for them. Yeah, I must definitely agree from my wild observations. If it's a cloudy day, nothing, almost nothing. One of my main spots has several hundreds just of floor at it. And I went on a cloudy day and I found one fully open flower, quite a few, you know, in between. So I'll open a little bit. You can see the nice dark center. But there's nothing apart from that. I've even had recently in Harmonis while looking for slacky eye flowers. I got up there. There's one nice and open. And I'm like, ooh, we're regular. Go have a look at them. And a fog cloud pulls over. And within 10 minutes, the flower's almost completely closed again. I had to pry it open to try and get a reasonable photo. So they're incredibly responsive to light. So it's pretty interesting how that works, actually. And they move quickly as well, don't they? When when the sun's on them, when they're ready to open, they can open in minutes, it seems. Certainly the Drossel City Floras. Yeah, no, they're super receptive to light, um, which is why you often find them, I think, in open areas. The Sundews here as a whole seem to respond very well to the shade around them. So like the Regias I was visiting recently, the only flower on the periphery of a population, if there's nothing growing next to it, if they're entrapped in taller grasses and they don't really flower much. But then right after a fire, all that shade and competition is gone and they flower like crazy from what I've heard. It's very, I think they're very light driven because there's no point you make a flower if it's a cloudy rainy day and your pollinator is not there or you're surrounded by grass and your pollinator can't get to you. So I think it's a very evolutionary driven response. So blast them when you want them to flower. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'm lucky enough I can kind of force them if I have a flower that's being stubborn I can take it inside put it under some of my brighter lights where it's warmer and I usually get it to open up the rest of the way can we talk about the if you're growing them in cultivation what's the duration of of light you should give them in the winter and then does it matter how much light they receive in the summertime that's a very good question um I I kind of did my setup by studying the the climate of where these plants grow. So I was looking at, you know, around Perth, Australia, which, you know, those tubers that grow around there and looking around, you know, places around where I know they grow in South Africa. And one of the important things is the, the photo period, how much light they're receiving per day. You need to keep it below a certain amount. So you have to remember they're growing during winter and not only is the temperature a trigger for them to go dormant, but longer photo periods can be too. Mm. So if you keep the photo period too long, you might send them dormant early. So I have a, an automatic system and I have it set to 33 degrees latitude for the photo periods. And that gives me about... 10 hours of daylight and at the winter solstice and it gets up to about 12 at the equinoxes and then 14 in the middle of summer of course when the plants are dormant they don't need any light so when they're all down you can just turn the lights off but generally you want to stay below about 12 hours while the plants are growing and that'll keep them happy I know in the past, like when I was first starting reading things online, I saw people claiming that you couldn't even exceed 10 hours and they'd be running their lights for only eight hours a day, which I always thought was strange. That's kind of what got me researching the climates. That is definitely odd for eight hours. It is about 10 to 11 hours in winter, but yeah. I have a fridge with my tissue cultures in for my micropropagation of winter growing Sundays. And I don't have a timer for it yet. So those lights have been burning 24-7 for the past three months or so. And there hasn't been any dormancy, but they're kept at about 16 degrees Celsius, which I think is probably the more important part of dormancy. When kept in a normal 25 to 30 degree grow room, they crash incredibly quickly. They absolutely hate it. They start dying. They're yellowing. But in the fridge, they've been flowering. They've been growing like crazy. And this covers everything from Sister Flora to Hilaris. Um, lots of trinovias, saharais, pretty much the entire range grows happily at about that temperature, no matter the photo period. But I think growing yeah, out of flask. Yeah, that's very interesting. I wonder if just 
being in the flask is changing things a bit. But I don't know exactly how sensitive the South African plants are. I know just this season, um, I had a friend buy a new plant that I'd also gotten as a Dressera macrophylla, one of the, the rosetted species from Australia. And he asked me if my plants looked okay. As he told me his were looking really ratty and seemed like they're going dormant already. So I asked him how long his photo period was. And I think he told me 14 hours. So he accidentally sent his plant dormant early on mine growing happily here. That's pretty interesting. The other thing about tissue culture is the light intensity is significantly lower than anything growing outside. Yeah, it's usually yeah. more of a photoregulation system then you know you're giving it enough energy to photosynthesize you give them sugar in the medium so they don't have to photosynthesize they're living stupendously easy um compared to anything that's growing outside so they grow very definitely... quickly too <laughs> oh yeah no they're growing ridiculously fast i've heard of people that had sister flora flower within a year of getting the seeds into culture i haven't had quite as much speed but some of my smaller things are flowering now already um, after a few initial hiccups. So I wish mine were that possible. fast. This, this Zayeri here took three years to flower from seed. My okay. sister floor tend to take at least four. <laughs> Under glass, of course, you don't need to worry about the light levels in terms of trying to adapt your, your lighting to the season because obviously they're growing with the seasons. But under during the winter months, certainly when these guys are in growth, um, and I find this more so with the South African species. They do appreciate some some supplementary lighting just for seven, eight hours a day, just giving that extra boost, certainly on, on grey days. The tuberous species seem to do pretty well without extra lighting. But when I saw them in Australia, a lot of them were growing in, in sort of foresty areas, fairly shaded areas, um, some obviously in full sun as well, of course. But um, I was quite surprised that, a lot of them weren't just in full open conditions, open to you know blazing light levels, um, and so they seem to be a little bit more more tolerant. Um, it, it's something that uh, I, I keep meaning to experiment with, given the tuberous species some extra lighting as well for the winter, just to see what it uh, what benefits there are to it when you've got them in in a greenhouse. But as it is, they seem to do pretty well. I get a decent bit of colour on them. They flower well. They seem pretty happy. Yeah, I think people might. Yeah. Oh, I, I was going to say, it's pretty pretty interesting that you find them growing in shaded areas, but it's probably because that's where the moisture sticks around the longest when summer's coming on. So they, I mean, the, the moisture is more important than more light in those situations. Possibly. It was only some of them. Not, not all, a lot of them were found in, in, in yeah, yeah. very open areas, but there's some species certainly were. In, in sort of forested areas. Yeah, the other thing about South African winter is it's not super pale and muggy like a lot of the northern, he northern hemispheres are, winters are. It's sunny pretty much year round. It's very bright. Even on cloudy days, the other day I was hiking, it was cloudy, and I got absolutely roasted through the clouds. Um, so the UV is nothing to sneeze at here in South Africa. And a lot of the times when I go look for Sister Flora, it's still like below 20 degrees, but it is bright, incredibly bright. So I don't think they enjoy low light levels a lot. And I mean, they grow almost almost only in exposed areas, really. Um, we have a fire system. They benefit greatly from the occasional clearing that happens every 10 to 15 years. We had at a local nature reserve down the road from me of Trinovia, about 150 meters that way. And they did a controlled burn in a section of bush in the middle of the park. Across the path were just some trinovia that I knew of. They were growing there. It was semi-disturbed, so there weren't too many other plants to bother them. And across the path was this giant stand of proteas as big as me, lots of other vegetation, super dense. You can't even walk through it. And they burnt it. And what pops out in winter? Tons of trinovia everywhere. So they obviously can survive in these areas that haven't been burnt for a long time. And then the moment it's clear, you really see a lot of them. And they flower like crazy. So I think the Winter growers, give them as much light as you can without cooking them is probably the best way to do it. Yeah, I'd say the same light intensity as you provide for any other sundew, especially if you want kind of optimal color. 
they'll definitely survive with less and they'll even do pretty well. Uh, they, some of the species can actually look fairly different in lower light levels. I know I have friends that will grow the, again, the rosetted tuber species in lower light and the leaves will stretch out a lot. They may not have as much color and sometimes they can almost look like a different species because <laughs> the, had that the leaves change before. so much. Me and Alex but, were looking I mean, for one well. of the yeah. Me and Alex were looking for one of the more obscure things we're trying to describe um, on a hillside in the Hrvinterk Mountains, and there's trinovia everywhere, thousands of them. And then we see one bigger plant. We're like, oh, finally we found it, and it's just an etiolated trinovia. It was <laughs> under a bush, didn't have enough lights, is almost twice the size of the rest, and it's really green and leggy and awful looking. I will <laughs> add though that Drosser hilaris and Drosser erigrinii are a little more shade tolerant, especially Hilaris. It doesn't seem to appreciate full sun. It generally grows on slightly shadier hillsides. I've seen it growing happily in exposed burn zones. But you can see it in the pigment formation. If it doesn't make red pigments, then it's typically not a plant that experiences crazy light stress. And it's mostly only in the Xeric species. I'm conflicting myself because there are bright growing ones that don't go red. Um, but Hilaris, I've not noticed enjoying super sunny conditions. So usually somewhere that gets some light and it will happily grow in a bush, flower in a bush, set seed in a bush. Hmm. A little bit odd from the rest, but they also follow different dormancy. So they're a bit of a different animal completely. Yeah, I was going to say we should probably clarify that species like Hilaris and Eric Greenyi are a bit different because they don't die all the way back to the roots in summer. They do have a, a dormancy period, but they're, it's kind of different from the stuff like Cystiflora and Trinervia. Yeah, so they're not sort of obligate winter growers per se. Oh, they, they are, but I believe Alex called them hemicryptophytes. So they die back to a growing bud at the end of the stem. Eric Greenia has it especially. It's a little green fuzzy bud right on top. And the moment the conditions are ideal again, <laughs> leaf comes out, start growing, do their thing. Whereas sister yeah. flora in them, they have their long roots underground and then they pinch off the top growth. Top growth dies completely and that plant is gone. It's usually blown away by the wind, rotted, whatever. So you can't even tell it's there if like if you go looking for them now. But Hilaris and stuff, there'll be little stands of straggly leaf pieces here and there and the stems with a tiny little bud on top. And that's how they chill waiting for the next season. Nigel, can we go back to when you went to Australia? Did you, when you said you saw some in shade and some in more sun, are you talking about the same species or are you talking about different species? No, different species. Um, a case in point was Drosera squamosa, with those wonderful red bands around the leaves. Um, there's one forested area we went to and every other plant was different. The, the diversity of the coloration was phenomenal. Some were pretty pale, some were dark burgundy color, some had that characteristic sort of red band inside the leaf. One or two we found were kind of reversed, where the, the outer bit was red, in a bit green, found pinks, lime greens. It was absolutely phenomenal. So um, yeah, and different species, different species we found in different areas. Uh, a lot of them, uh, um, top of my head, Oh, here we are. Another one of the few I brought in with me from the greenhouse. I'd have done this in the greenhouse, but the signal here is so poor. I have to, I've had to bring a few things up here. This is a Rupicola, green form of Rupicola. Um, oh. These guys oh, we found, man. there was a, a orange green like this and a red form, all at the same site in, in different sort of clumps, um, but three distinct color forms and the smell. Oh, you're missing this, tell you. Absolutely beautiful. They produce that wonderful, sweet, almost cinnamony smell that can fill the greenhouse. They're beautiful things. So, yeah, different um, different species in different conditions. Regarding light, can mm -hmm. any of these plants make a good windowsill plant? I'd say the tuber species more likely. Certainly some of the, the smaller growers. Oh, actually, the, the taller climbers as well, because you can stake them like that and they'll do their thing this guy here look if i stretch him out he's actually about two feet yeah at least two feet in another round table i accidentally asked the panel if these 
if that plant or that group of plants could be a house plant. And of course, <coughs> there's so much technology with lighting and grow cabinets and et cetera. Like anything could be a house plant, but for exactly. but for these winter growing ones, um, so Nigel, you kind of think that they could maybe in the growing season you could have them on a windowsill, as long on as you south, provide, yeah, yeah, on a south facing window if you're in the northern hemisphere, so they get as much sun as possible. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, in, in the um, and you could probably grow them all year round. To be honest, I mean they'll they'll have their natural cycles. They'll they'll react to the light levels regardless of, of manipulation, it seems. So they'll die back when they're ready. Um, they'll die back to their, their, their tubers and reappear in the, in the autumn. Is, yeah. hum is humidity a factor for any of these winter growing sundews or can they acclimate or, or is it a non-factor? I don't think it's a factor particularly. I've not grown them on in the house on window sills my windows are all, all very small and face the wrong direction unfortunately um so all of my plants are out in the greenhouse plus i think if i started putting these plants around the house that'll be divorce proceedings so, <laughs> so they're safely safely out 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 out, uh, out there where they can't be thrown um but uh, i think it mentioning humidity is is definitely an issue for me in the winter now this isn't we're going off off piste here um, Rodigula is a big problem in the winter for me because the greenhouse is closed for obvious reasons. Um, very still, we've got lots of grey, damp conditions uh, days here, and Rodigulas really struggle, certainly dentata. Um, they seem to grow for a couple of years, and you're fine till you get to the winter, then they'll suddenly just brown off. The individual branches, the, the leaves will sort of curl in on themselves, literally overnight. You know, you could you can walk in in the morning and see several have done it. If you leave those without removing them, those damaged branches, they tend that tends to spread through the rest of the plant, and the whole thing will just collapse in a matter of days. So that's that's a big issue. Um, I know people have grown Rodigula on window sills. Uh, obviously, it's much drier in a house than it is in a greenhouse, um, and they don't have that issue. So I think humidity for that plant certainly is is a, a major factor. Yeah, I would say that humidity doesn't really matter for the winter growers. It's just like most carnivorous plants, it's not really a concern. I did actually used to grow these indoors and it mostly did okay. I think I had some issues with dormancy as the temperatures didn't change much. But um, and I know plants, uh, I think you have Planchonia there. I've seen people grow Indumenta on the windowsill and it seemed to do pretty well. Um, also grabbed my Eric Greeny eye here. Oh, oh, oh. Show what they look like. <laughs> Starting to flower. I got a little stock coming up there. It's been hard to see, but yeah, I grow this out here too. It's, it's much uh, bigger than any I've seen in the wild. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, it's much taller. Um, I must actually check when the last fire was at the type location. It might be bigger in the. There's a recently discovered spot in the mountains, also here near Salabash. Oh yeah, they, let, they weren't known from there until they cut a panorama trail high up in the in the mountain. I think it gets to about eight hundred, nine hundred meters elevation. Then it's popping up everywhere. Um, that's why I love looking for them here because I love colonizing a path side because it's nice and open, makes them super easy to find. <laughs> yeah, and it's nice and not that... having to crawl through a bush to get a photo of one. Now, going back to the topic of Arigula, um, I've actually weirdly found them easier to keep through winter than Drosophyllum, which just about always rot on me in the middle of winter, but I have a, a Arigula dentata right behind my phone here that's doing just fine. I tend to lose a few growth points each winter, but it, uh, it keeps going for the most part as long as I keep it under nice bright light. Mm. Do you I have a fan in there as well? Yeah. No. No, I don't know. If it's just in the open air, and it is very right. humid out here. Um, it rains constantly during winter. It's actually mm -hmm. snowing right now, but <laughs> <laughs> it is very humid out here. The Rota Dentata seems to do okay. Um, it's not like greenhouse humid. But... Yeah. Uh, I think the big thing... Oh, yeah, Kenny? 
Well, Hanja, I was going to say that at the beginning, John mentioned that uh, these plants generally like wet winters and drier, hot summers. So I was going to ask you how wet is South Africa and um, are they in seepages? Are they on mountains? Are they on rocky mountains? Or is their soil freely draining? Oh, now that is a tough question because they grow in everything, which makes it very hard to pin down. I have noticed sort of some endemicity for certain soils, but we have quite a lot of different soil types in the Cape. But a lot of things love seepages and wetlands. A lot of things grow in, especially the bulk of the lowland stuff, your sister floras, a lot of parts of floras, Zaharai, Kochi, Betler. They live in seasonally damp um, soils. It can be clay. A lot of it is sand. So... It's generally moist to some extent. So I've not noticed winter grows often in super waterlogged conditions. Some of the lowland sister flora grow in very big wetlands down on the south coast. But one of the new species I'm working on grows on superficially extremely dry rocky mountainsides. So it's very odd. They seem, I think there's often a lot more soil water content that you can't see. So I need to actually start carrying a moisture probe around with me. But yeah, it's moist. We get the bulk of our rain in winter. I think 80% or more is in winter time. And then when summer comes, it all dries out. So the perennial species of Drosera, like Yorkopensis and Admirablis and so on, they only grow where it's wet year round. Usually stream sides or very large seepages. So that's Yorkopensis, Admirablis, Regia, Alicia to some extent. And a lot of the other ones grow in coastal areas, along with Regula gorgonius. They get very frequent fogs on very well-draining sands. So they get made wet fairly often, but it never stays super moist. And they seem to be happy that way. I think for a redilla, they just get a lot of airflow, a lot of wind, because the coast is always obscenely windy here in South Africa. I think that's probably one of the key things. A little bit damp, lots of air movement. The Antarctica I haven't seen, so I can't comment on. But they grow in the inland Cedarburg Mountains, which are a lot drier through summertime. They don't have the coastal fogs that permeate the coast. So different strokes for different plants, really. But to sum it up for winter growers, generally they're pretty moist, not waterlogged like you'd expect in the sort of Saracenia bogs or how you'd grow capensis. So I grow mine about one to two centimeters of water, and they generally stay moist enough to be happy. Now you mentioned Dracera capensis. Can you talk about, we're not saying that they are a winter grower correct? That is very correct. <laughs> they are more summer growers. In some places, it gets cold enough to send them into dormancy. Um, some people have them growing outside. They get frosted. The top of the plant dies back, and they pop out from the roots again. I found entire colonies of small little unfurling leaves from roots in mats, also in the Cedarburg, not too far from Arutula dentata. It just gets so cold up there in winter, and the capen's like, not worth it, and they go hide for a while. And sometimes they also get flooded and die back. And then when the water recedes, they grow out again. Now you mentioned there, you mentioned capensis growing back from the roots. So one of our social media questions was, can you propagate tuberous or winter growing sundews from their roots? Yeah, so before does... the experts chime in, um, I've just observed in herbarium specimens I collect. And so most South African winter growers have relatively few roots. In the wild, things like Trinovi, they have one root, they go dormant, and the next season they grow a new root for dormancy. Whereas a lot of the bigger plants reuse the same root and sometimes make multiples. I believe Nigel has shown me photos where he just has this massive roots coming out of a plant. And I'm sure if you divide those, you could probably propagate them. But a lot of people also don't like disturbing winter growing roots. During dormancy, they're not as tough as, say, tuberous, and they don't always necessarily make extra like tuberous and used to. Uh, I can actually chime in here because I've uh, <laughs> I've accidentally done root cuttings before. I had had a pot of cystiflora that the the soil was really not in good shape, and it was you know obviously harming the plants. So I went to repot them, and the roots were just breaking apart at the slightest touch. So I ended up with all these pieces of cystiflora roots, and I just planted them all. And every single one of them grew uh, when the growing season started again. 
So for those type of plants, you can do it. And also when they produce multiple roots, which you said some species do naturally, every root should grow back as a separate plant the next year. Since when they die back, there's no longer a connection between all these roots. I do have a pot over here of one cystiflora that started out as one plant, and I think it's eight now after a couple of years. Uh, but as for tuber species, their roots are very thin and wiry, and it's not something you could ever propagate off of. You have to go by the tubers. And some people have been experimenting in recent years with actually taking the plant you know, mid-season or towards the end of the season and actually cutting the tuber off the bottom. And so you're separating the, the top growth with the stem going down the soil from the tuber at the bottom. And then the plant will can form multiple tubers around the wound. And so you can do that to kind of force it to produce extra tubers, although it's definitely risky. <laughs> Sounds a bit extreme, doesn't it? <laughs> it's yeah, not but, something, um, I've not tried that yet. I must give it a go, actually. Yeah, as I say, some of these, some of the tuber species particularly are extremely rarely produce extra tubers. So you can sit there with one single plant for 10 years and they won't self-pollinate. So how are you supposed to propagate it? You can't do leaf cuttings. <laughs> Oh, that's interesting, because uh, winter grows you can do from leaf cuttings like crazy. They take pretty easily in general. Yeah. I've started a lot that way. I've struggled to get them to the rooting size, but I know some people do it very well. It's just, I think, a practice issue. But the Using the early leaves, can... I understand. Yeah, I've done it with everything from the starter leaves to um, stem leaves. I'm sure you could even do stem segments if you really feel mm. like chopping your plant up completely. But you don't want to take too many because then you're drawing a lot of the energy the plant needs to make itself a nice fat root for dormancy. Are tubers, sundews, um, do they not self-pollinate? Some do. It varies. <laughs> okay, it varies. <laughs> so let's say we have one uh, species that does not self-pollinate and you propagate it vegetatively, either by a leaf pull or tubers. Can its genetically, can its genetic clone, if it's flowering and its mother flowering, can you get that to pollinate? I would have said no. Okay. Just because it's the same clone. Is that, that would be akin to having, as we got here, three, four, flower stalks on Off the same, the same yeah. on the same plant it would be a, be a, a, a self compatibility issue i guess it depends yeah, on a little, yeah as i say it depends on what type of self incompatibility it is if it's genetic then it's not going to work but there can also be a timing issue where the flowers aren't receptive at the same time they're producing pollen so if you have the same clone with the flower timing slightly off, they could work. But I don't know if that's the case for any particular species. No, I'm not sure either. And then Drosser regia, again, not a winter grower, but that's a, a case in point for that, isn't it? That was always yeah. considered as being self-sterile. Um, but that's, yeah, that's exactly false. right. I do need to go back to the watering. So for those who are growing them in cultivation, can you talk about your water procedure? Are you using the tray method, overhead watering? What, what, what are you doing, Nigel? I use the tray method. Um, I tend to, okay, let's start from when they begin growth, sort of se September, October for a lot of them. Um, I'll gradually introduce the water up to about a centimeter depth maintain it about that level if it dries a little bit you know let that go down then replenish it uh, you wouldn't keep them as wet as you would say drosser capensis and your, your, your bog standard plants um the the cystiflora complex where the winter grain south africans i i i do exactly the same introduce the water just a little bit as they start coming through increase it the more the plants appear up to about a centimeter depth then when they start dying back i'll stop watering 
let them dry out fairly slowly. I mean, the temperatures at that time are normally fairly cool still, so they're not going to dry out too quickly. Let them die back under their own pace. Then over the summer months, I tend to keep them dry, but occasionally I'll just go over them with a hose or just a little bit of water at the base of the pots just to give them a little bit of moisture so the roots and the tubers, because bear in mind in the ground, they're, they're, they've got access to, to more moisture than they've got in a pot like this. So they're more susceptible to dehydration and, and desiccation. So just a little bit of water every few weeks, every say six weeks in the summer, just to keep them ticking over. But you don't want to let them sit in water, <clears throat> certainly not the tuberous species because they can send their tubers down to the bottom of the pots too early to see any on these um, and quite often you repot them every year and the tubers at the end of the season are, are sticking out the holes in the bottom there keep them too wet during the summer they're likely to rot so just just be fairly fairly careful doing that but just enough to stop them desiccating yeah that's pretty much exactly what i do you can see i have trays here um, i don't tend to keep quite as much water in them but i do have a lot of short pots here for seedlings and I think the only thing I do differently is I tend to give the South African plants more water during summer than the tubers. I do find that they're more vulnerable to desiccation than the tubers are. And another thing I wanted to mention, you, you were talking about how the tubers can go all the way in the bottom of the pot. And I find that makes them even more vulnerable because they're right next to the drain holes and there's moisture escaping through those drain holes during summer and i've had times where even in a huge pot like uh like this size here i'll have tubers all the way in the bottom and i'll go to check on them and i'll find a shriveled up tuber in the bottom of the pot <laughs> but um, i've also had instances where i've had a tuber come out the bottom of a pot and it'll form in the tray and it'll sit in the tray all summer long, getting repeatedly flooded when I water it. And I'll go to move pots around and fall. I'll pick up the pot and there's a tuber hanging off it that's still perfectly fine. <laughs> Even though it's been going through all these wet and dry <laughs> cycles all summer. But I wouldn't expect that to happen with most species. That was things like Gracilis and Andersoniana that are a lot more tolerant of uh, these things than others yeah some you can keep wetter or yeah like you say brisalis etc i get them seeding in the nursery sometimes in with the saracenias um so obviously oh, yeah. a lot wetter in the summer they die back and they just reappear when they're ready what size pots do we recommend for people who get their first seed or their first tuber it depends on seeds versus tubers I think I've sown all my seeds in 10 centimeter, four inch cube pots. Um, cause it's just doesn't use as much space cause they don't always germinate, unfortunately, especially in the first season. Um, a few people had that experience and then it's easier just to keep a 10 centimeter pot out of the way. But for larger plants, I know Nigel uses big pots. And I'm sure John does too. I'd recommend something like a five inch cube upwards, just large volume. Really makes gives them a lot of space to make their roots and tubers and also retains a bit more moisture for summer dormancy um, exactly. just keeps that a little bit moist doesn't let it dry out completely these are in i just checked 13 centimeter square so five inch and they've got the extra depth as well which for the tubers right and, and for the south africans is is pretty essential but i still repot them the tubers this is um every july august when i when i get time to do it um, just to lift up those tubers that are hanging out the bottom, get them up into the top sort of inch and a half or so of the pot, and then off they go again. I actually use smaller pots myself. This is one of my mature pots. This is only a three and a half inch or nine, uh, eight. Yeah, I think about eight centimeters, and this is five inches tall. I've grown in the larger ones before, but I've found that any plant that hits the bottom of one of these hits the bottom of the larger pots too. So what's the point? <laughs> I think it depends a lot. I know some of the cystiflor will do the same. They'll get the roots all the way down to the bottom of the big pots. Um, and I use even smaller ones for the seeds here. Grab one of these. 
This is only a two and a half inch by three and a half inch tall pot. This is what I use for seeds. And they do just fine. I've even had, um, I've had plants flower in these. It just depends on the species. Some of them, I mean, some of the tubers, they'll only go that deep. They don't even get halfway to the bottom of these pots. Other ones, even in the first season, they'll be, you know, almost ready to come out the bottom of them. So it varies a lot. I think it also depends on your dormancy conditions because I've been keeping my dormant pots outside and the Cape Summer out of the sun for the most part, but like my trays dry out in two to three days just with how hot and dry it is. So the bigger pots are better for me because I'll water a yeah. pot, I'll top water at about a centimeter um, every week. And by the end of that week, it's bone dry inside if you stick your finger in it. So I think it very much depends on indoors versus outdoors, how hot your summer is, how humid it is. So it's hard to give a straight answer. I think for most of it, so you want to keep it a tiny, slight bit moist, but not completely dry. Too wet and they rot, too dry and they desiccate. And That's another, thing, another yeah. thing to consider under glass, of course, is the summer months. On the rare occasion that we get exceptionally hot temperatures, and it normally happens a couple of times a year, um, <clears throat> I always keep the, the, the plants when they're dormant, just under some, some shade cloth just to keep the worst of the heat off. It stops them drying out too much and too rapidly as well. Um, but a word of warning, a few years back, I was I was being clever um, and I used had some old horticultural fleece. So rather than using the shade netting, I figured, well, actually the fleece is white in color, so it should reflect the heat off a bit better. Um, so anyway, I, long story short, um, when I got to tip all the tubers out later that year, I realized that a lot of them had actually cooked it heated up so much under the fleece that um, a lot of them had um, decided to depart, which was a bit of heartbreaking and a real worry as well, because I thought I did the same thing with, with the um, South African drosseras, um, and I had to wait until the autumn to, to check that they were actually still alive, which was a real period of worry because I thought I'd cooked them a lot. So never use horticultural fleece over them, just use shade netting so it allows the, the pots to breathe underneath. Yeah, that is a very good point to um, make sure you keep the pots out of the sun during dormancy because you really can cook the plants and kill them that way. Absolutely. You have to remember that they're underground in the wild. So even if it's really hot on the surface, the temperature drops rapidly as you go deeper. So during dormancy, the, the tubers and roots should actually stay pretty cool. For Another those, recommendation, yeah. I was going to say, for those who get seeds and tubers, what, how do you get them to start growing? Or like what season, what environment, what temperature should you be sowing them? I would either recommend sowing right at the beginning of your sort of winter period or sowing them later in the year. You can sow them in summer and just sort of leave them and once they're ready, they'll start growing. Um, I might be wrong on this, but that's essentially the strategy I'm trying now. So it's some midwinter. It's got very little germination on my South African winter grows. I did about 25 different types, very few germinated. And now I'm leaving them over summer and around June, July, just before sort of in autumn time, I'm going to give them water and see what pops up. I think you don't want to sow them too late in your winter season because you risk them germinating and then not making it to a dormancy size before winter starts. So I'd either recommend beginning of winter or beginning of summer. John and, Hen and Nigel could probably... Yeah, Henry, are you um, surface sowing them or do you bury them a little bit? I surface sowed them on a mix of sand and peat. I think I used a little bit too much silica sand and then the surface doesn't get as wet as seeds really want it for germination. So I'd advise something a little bit peatier, or you could maybe put a thin layer of peat on top and compress it, and that should wick up a nice amount of moisture or germination. But for adult plants, I use half silica sand and half peat moss. Yeah, that's actually one of the reasons I use smaller pots for seeds, these little tiny ones, and make sure it gets enough moisture up to the surface. But um, this is a pot of seedlings I started this year. I don't know how well you can see all the tiny little plants in there. There's a Drosera menziesii. But um, 
it really depends on the species. A lot of them you can just sow, you know, beginning of fall and whatever, and they'll start germinating when it's cold enough, which is a good point that the temperatures are very important. A lot of these will not germinate at room temperature. They need to be much colder, particularly at night, for the seeds to germinate. And some of them will just germinate like that whenever, but a lot of them, especially the tuber species, they need a, a hot, dry stratification. So the seeds will sit out on, on the surface, out on the sand during summer after they're produced, and they just get cooked in the sun all summer and a lot of them need that hot dry period to uh, break down the inhibition so they can actually germinate. I agree, absolutely. So I, I tend to um, sow mine. If you, if you, if you consider their, their, their natural cycles, they shed the seed late winter as the plants die off. So I tend to, if I've got seed to sow, I tend to sow it then, sort of March time. And I'll surface sow them, as Hendry said, um, just in pots on damp peat and sand, then let them dry out. And then I'll tuck them away summer in the nursery where they're not going to get kicked over. Let them bake all summer. And then I tend to give them a smoke treatment, sort of September time, re-wet them, keep them wet then, and they'll germinate when, like you say, when you've got that, those cooler nights, warm days, cool nights. When you get those that scenario, that's when they tend to start germinating. So, John, you just showed us a picture of what appears to be a lot of little seedlings. Yeah. Um, can you separate them? When do you separate them? How do you separate them? Uh, you know, I just I usually just leave them. I don't actually like repotting these plants. I've always found that disturbing the tubers tends to screw up their growth cycle a little bit. Um, and I've heard the same about the South Africans. So I usually leave them in place as long as I can. And oftentimes when they get big enough, I'll just take one of those pots and I'll dump out the soil, you know, keep it in a big block and just stick that in a larger pot and let them keep going. Um, but yeah, when they're that size, I mean, the tubers could be these tiny little specks would be difficult to tell them apart from the sand at that point. <laughs> So it's just way too time consuming to be trying to deal with that. So I'll, I usually leave them in these small pots for a couple of years before I start thinking about repotting or anything. And your, do you, can you separate them when they're actively growing or do you have to wait for them to go into dormancy? I, I would definitely wait. Um, so that's a stem forming species. They grow tall and narrow. And I noticed even with the adult tubers on that species, if you try to mess with them, the stem will break off the tuber with just the slightest touch. And, and so the you, roots they you do. Juice. Sorry. I was going to say, you, you don't want to risk damaging them by trying to move them around while they're growing. And the roots are so fine, you're likely to break them off as well. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But some of them, um, like the rosetted species, they have much stronger stems. They're unlikely to break. You could move them, but again, the roots are pretty fragile, so it's generally recommended to avoid it. All right, we got two last questions. Um, Henry, what, you kind of mentioned it earlier, but what types of soils do you find them in and do we need to replicate that identically in cultivation, or are they can they do a standard uh, Drosera mix? So in situ, it's often very, very poor soils. Um, Feinbos is known for having almost zero nutrients, which is why I think we have so many carnivorous plants. It's a pretty prime space to explore. A lot of the habitats are sandy, um, often a little bit of peat in and around it, but Sandy as a basis for almost all the species, except for stuff like Admirabilis, Regia, and Capensis, which grows in very much more wet peats. Even Slackii, you find it in little streams in Harmonis, but it's very fine, gritty sand. Or in the little wet spots um, where Slackii also grows, it's very peaty. If you break it up, it's tiny little sand bits. 
And so far, people have good luck with sand and peat, but half half, sometimes even more sand. I've used some perlite in my mixes, but I despise it because I grew a lot outdoors. When it rains and all the perlite floats out and sits on the surface, and it becomes pretty useless. So, sand and peat is definitely the king here. So it gives you a good mix of drainage and grittiness, aeration, holds some water, but not too much. I think it's just generally a good baseline. And I think a lot of the tuberous sunnies also grow in predominantly fairly sandy parts. I have sand to be corrected there. John and Nigel, do you have a different recipe for tuberous versus South African species? I use about, I use about the same for both. A mix of, um, I'm using quartz sand, which is a much larger particle sand. Um, it, it makes a really attractive top dressing as well. So I use a mix of that and peat, um, heavy on the sand, 60% sand or even 70% to 40 or 30 peat. And I use the same for, for the tubers and the South African rose. Yeah, it's pretty similar for me. I use fairly large grain sand. I I used to aim for about 75% sand, but um, the, the new peat I have now is much coarser. It doesn't mix up quite as well. So I'm finding I have to use less sand or it ends up looking too sandy and not wicking up water well. But yeah, the same for everything, basically. Um, but Nigel, do you have a plan for um, when they ban peat over there? I know they've been talking about it a lot lately. I've actually been working with uh, DEFRA, which is the, the government department that handle that, for handling that. And they've kind of gone quiet, actually. Um, the last uh, meeting we had, this talk of uh, dispensation for certain types of plants, uh, mm -hmm. ours being, being one of them. Um, but in terms of the, the ban, there isn't really any word on it. They're talking about the retail ban of peat in the next couple of years. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. and multi-purpose, etc. Um, but that's really as, as far as it seems to be going at the moment. Um, the We just don't know, to be honest, in terms of, of when any ban is likely to come into place in terms of the professional sector. Um, it seems it's probably not going to be for a number of years. And then, as I say, there's likely to be some kind of dispensation for certain kinds of plants. And as specialist nurseries, we'll be able to continue supplying peat and peat compost to our customers. Um, and so at the moment, I, I, uh, there, obviously, people do use alternatives. Some people grow their, their collections entirely peat free. But if you've got a few plants in a, in a greenhouse, it's, it's, it's easier to do because alternatives I've seen and, and messed around with you, you you tend to see the compost break down and this really isn't talking about these guys I'm doing that Saracenias and the mainstream plants the uh, the alternatives tend to break down after a year or two um, don't hold their structures and so you end up having to repot everything every couple of years which if you've got a small collection in a greenhouse is is doable but I've I don't know got 16 18 thousand plants in the nursery so I can't be repotting all those every every year or two. It'd be completely unworkable. And so from a, there are a different set of, of hurdles. People think it's, it's an easy enough problem to overcome, but there are a different set of hurdles if you're growing plants on a professional basis to if you're growing them just simply as a hobbyist in your back garden. All right, the last question is, why should people consider growing these winter or winter sundews, tuber sundews, or why should people be more invested in their conservation? Yeah, I have an awesome answer for the first part. They are some of the biggest sundews in general, like sister flora, big. I've seen plants 35, 40 centimeters tall. And on top of that, the biggest flowers of any sundew by a pretty decent margin. I think the largest sister flora flower I've seen is three inches across and I have photographic proof of this. It, they are enormous. There's very few other sundews that do that. I mean the biggest capensis flower I've seen is four centimeters across and that was a line bred yeah. specifically for a big flower. Now imagine if we did that for Sister Flora, how pretty <laughs> massive. We could have a thing the size of your head if we tried hard enough. And then the color range is just amazing. And Sister Flora alone 
very, very controversial, the speciation system for it. But you got whites, creams, lavenders, pinks, purples, yellow, red, lots of things in between. There's weird hybridization at sites that produce the funkiest color combinations. There's even stuff like the <laughs> salmon pink ones, loads of morphological variety. It's just not stuff you get with the other sundews. And you also really appreciate them for like the five months that they're there and you sit and wallow while waiting for them to come out again. <laughs> I have to sit and do nothing, twiddle my thumbs between field seasons because I only have a short amount of time to really go cherish them. Here's my answer yeah. to that. that. That's why you grow them. Just there, as Hendry said. Aren't they stunning? Absolutely beautiful. And they they grow when everything else is, is dormant and there's nothing else to see. Fascinating plants. Hendry mentioned the uh, salmon. I think there was a salmon one I sent you and um, a photo of some of the red flowers. They are just exquisite. Worth the effort. Yeah, I was, I was going to basically say the same. I mean, these are some of the most beautiful sundews you can grow that some of them have really really wonderful flowers and they're all growing when all your saracenia are all brown outside <laughs> so you've got something to enjoy during winter uh, besides your tropical plants all right very good so thank you panel and thank you for everyone who is watching this round table and if you have a round table or webinar idea or topic, please send me a message and I will branch out and contact people all over the world so we can have another roundtable. So thank you panelists for joining us today. Thank you. You're most welcome. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. The International Carnivorous Plant Society wants you to be successful with your plants. We welcome growers just getting started all the way through professional scientists. We started an annual World Carnivorous Plant Day to celebrate these spectacular plants. Take a look around our website and you'll find historic documents about carnivorous plants, growing guides, free educational resources, and more. Have questions? Ask. We don't bite. But our plants do. Point out my Rupacola here. I got a nice kind of orange one that's also flowering right now. Um, I got all sorts of plants. Uh, Mananthas all done. You can see this half major is completely dormant already. <laughs> um, I got all sorts of stuff growing in here. More Casiana. <laughs> And yeah, Orbiculata is dormant. Oh, there's my uh, Smirked Callus, which I think Nigel was talking about being a really late one. Yeah, Still mine are half that open. size. Yeah. It's actually the first time I've gotten it to grow at all in the past. It's just had this little nub at the soil and it never grows mm -hmm. any further. I think it was too dry. So I, I repotted it this year and it's actually growing, which is nice. And uh, these big masses here, uh, or not that one. Now, like this back here, this is a uh, Dorsera pallida, which is a species that always comes up in August. <laughs> the weird ones growing in the middle of summer. Um, it's funny how they know, isn't it? My my um first ones out are always Macrantha, and there are one or two pots of it that yeah, are yeah. always I always spot third week of August. It it seems yeah, to be that precise. That's this one right here. That's my macrantha. It comes up that early too. Yeah. Along with Polita. But uh what else? I got lots of uh some new stuff I got from uh Best Carnivorous Plants this year. Flowery eye. And up here all the seeds. <laughs> wow, that looks fantastic. Yeah. Stand up here. Got some uh Trinervia that's almost oh, ready species. to flower. Yeah. <laughs> I got too many of those. And then we got some uh, Cistifloras, little seedlings. Those are second year. Oh, south of Malmesbury. Was that an Alex site? Yeah, yeah, that's one of the Alex's. And I got some uh, purple. I figure what my camera's pointing here is a purple flower from California carnivores. And... Oh, nice. Got supposedly passiflora. I'm still trying but, to confirm that. Uh, <laughs> give me a good look at those end tentacles. That uh, doesn't look know, super. Like, yeah, I don't think I'm going to be able to get very close with this. It looks like a trinovia to me. You will send me a photo later. 
Yeah, I can. And Alex thought it might be right, but I'm not sure. Maybe it could this be. Little, this little tiny species, Drosera selena, these little tiny rosettes that don't really come out of the soil properly. <laughs> And oh, then okay. this is as tall as it gets. This is a tiny little thing. That was one we saw in the wild. Weeds. Chris, we, uh, John, sorry, we saw that one in the wild. And the oh, color, yeah. they were just growing on this white sand. And they were a dark burgundy color. It was, they were absolutely phenomenal. And it was, what what struck me with the place was it seemed to be really windy. And these little plants would just dance on the surface in the wind. It was absolutely incredible. Yeah, and the uh, the sand will actually cover up the rosettes mostly, so you yeah. can hardly even see them. <laughs> exactly. That's why Fimbriata has those Fimbriate leaves at the base, isn't it? So Yeah, so unfortunately, that's, that's one species I don't have. <laughs> I lost Salina when I baked everything the other year. Oh, yeah, yeah. And what else we got here? Got some little schmutzy seedlings. Got the Yolgarnensis, Nada. Oh, yeah. And there's Gracilis. These things are horrible weeds. They get everywhere. Yeah. They're spread into all sorts of pots. And here's a, a F tuba stylus. You can see some of the plants are dormant or going dormant already. Hey, I got all kinds of stuff up here. A bunch of these need to be upgraded to larger pots. <laughs> You're going to have to extend into the garage, aren't you, a bit more? Well, I got another shelf to work with, so. John, if you have a pot with a whole bunch of plants, would you put that whole pot into a bigger pot with trying not to disturb the roots, or would you want to break them up? It depends. If I'm, I try not to disturb the tubers whenever possible, but. You know, sometimes it's kind of hard to avoid. Um, like this one right here, this uh, Drosera magna produced extra tubers for the first time this year. I've had one plant for like four years and all of a sudden I have seven. <laughs> uh, I'm probably going to repot that. I probably split them up, particularly since they're so crowded there. The others like um, Andersoniana here, I just dropped the seedling pot right in there and mm -hmm. keep going. All right. Well, unfortunately, I have to go. <laughs> I've got a couple of, a couple of others to show. Oh, sure. <laughs> uh, let's get into the camera. See that, Hendrik? Oh, oh, that is a holy grail. Oh, yeah. That is, that is the, the best. Uh, what it's, is it's that? Pretty, it's Drosera alba. Oh, alba. Oh, wow. Got quite a pot uh, of those. <laughs> I think yeah, you're like I, one of the three people that actually has good looking alba. I grew it from seed about, God, God knows how many years ago. Oh, this hit. Didn't show mine. All right, let's try this again. I forgot my alba hiding over here beside the Casiana. <laughs> oh, that's so cute. Oh, it's starting to produce the upright leaves, yeah? Yeah, they're I starting to put seeds. up the tall leaves. They're getting there. Yeah, I sowed some. I didn't have any germination over my last winter, and I had one in vitro which died. Um, kudos to the warm grow room. I'll need to sow some more. They're very seed poor in general. They're very weird. That whole complex. Yeah, yeah. I got all my sister flower back in the corner here. I got a whole bunch of flower buds coming, but nothing's better. Nice. Yeah. I need to rearrange things so it's easier to see. I don't have this big mass in front of them. <laughs> That's the problem with the climbers. They make such a mess, don't they? Yeah, yeah, they really do. I was trying to get in here to see the um, that one sister floor that multiplied on me, but it's just behind everything. So, oh well. <laughs> this is uh, Afro. Oh, very Afro. nice. I love the flowers on that one. Um, yeah, it has a nice sort of purplish. Really purplish beautiful flower. color, isn't it? Yeah. Petula, you saw this the other day, didn't you? Hendrik? Oh, lovely. I contaminated all my tissue cultures. I'm so bleak about that. One or two left. You know, as we were saying earlier about um, depth of the roots, the first time I ever grew coxid petula, I was trying to, every year I changed the top dressing, tipped it over the bin, 
knocking the old sand off and saying, gone. Never did find the bloody thing. <laughs> yeah, some of the roots can be don't really hold, short. Don't hold them over the bin. As an Esperanza. You can see that. Oh, oh nice. Very nice. Lighting isn't very good in here. I actually repotted my Alba last year. And even though on these mature plants, the roots are like that long. <laughs> They're so small. Yeah, Alba lives in very shallow sand pans up on Hofbad and surrounding areas. So it's based on Ever Rock and there's a little bit of sand and moss on top of it and they just grow in that. They usually angle their roots apparently with the water flow direction as well. They mysteriously, mysteriously desiccate in the summer. 